I've already been told by coach, he says, look, I've only got 35 minutes to talk, so do not spend a lot of time introducing me. So that, that made it easy. But uh, I've known uh, coach for uh, a long time, and it's a privilege to introduce uh, my ing- invited guest speaker today. Uh, one who really needs little introduction is I could spend uh, the entire hour listing uh, Coach Holtz's numerous accomplishments and accolades. Coach Holtz graduated with a bachelor's degree in science from Kent State while playing football and a master's degree in arts and education from Iowa. He then pursued a long and very distinguished coaching career, including the only coach in history to take six different teams to bowl games, win five bowl games with different teams, and to have four different college teams ranked in the final top 20 poll. He's been labeled as the coach who can take a pretender to a contender. He is legendary for his 11 seasons at Notre Dame and coaching them to a national championship in 1988. Many of us know him as an ESPN sports analysis by his matter-of-fact, colorful commentary and wit on Sports Center and Game Day. He's influenced thousands of players with his leadership and insistence on values, insistence of excellence, and importance of education. In 2008, he won a very distinguished award. He was selected to the College Football Hall of Fame. In his little spare time, he is an avid golfer and enjoyed by all our men's group at Lake Nona, where he lives with his lovely wife, Beth. Please join me in welcoming my good friend, Dr. Uh, Coach Lou Holtz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I appreciate that nice introduction. I'm here because of the tremendous respect I have for Dr. Akali. He he has been an invaluable friend to us, and he's been a, my wife's been a patient of his, and he's just the very best. But he and Carolyn are just a great family, and that's the main reason I'm here. I, I was looking at everybody you've had speak the last 17 years. You had 14 doctors out of the last 17 speakers, and I want you to understand who Lou Holtz is not. I'm not a singer. I'm not a dancer, I'm not an entertainer, I'm not an intellect. When I graduated from high school, I was in the lower third of my high school class. If it was not for people like me, there could have been no upper half of the class. I was just <laughs> on the bottom of it. Somebody said you've written three New York Times bestselling books. That is true. You're looking at the only guy in the world who's written more books than he has read. So I, I say that. <laughs> so you understand, I'm just a simple individual. And 10% of you won't remember 10% of what I said 10 minutes after I said it. But for the next 32 minutes, I want to share my thoughts and ideas. I'm not going to preach to you. I'm not going to lecture to you. The stories I'm going to tell you are things that actually happened. I'm going to talk about things I believe, things I've done. I'm not going to talk about something I read about or heard about. I'm going to talk about things I truly believe. When I went to the University of Notre Dame, Father Joyce said, Coach, there are certain things in Notre Dame not negotiable. Don't come here and change them. I said, what are they? We don't take transfers, red shirt, have high academic standards, poor football facilities, go and play the most difficult schedule we can find. He said, in addition to that, we have a policy at Notre Dame. The head football coach at Notre Dame is not allowed to make more than the president of Notre Dame. And the president of Notre Dame is a priest that took the vow of poverty. <laughs> now, he didn't say anything that would keep us from winning. He didn't say you could only play with eight and everybody else has 11. What he said, you got problems, you got difficulty in everything you do. You have problems, I have problems, you're never going to meet anybody again that doesn't have problems. And I'm almost 82. My birthday candles cost more than a cake, but I don't care how long you live, you're going to have problems. I'm at the university, I, I think March 20, uh, excuse, June 22nd, 2015. I am awakened at 2.30 in the morning by the smoke alarm. Our house had hit by lightning, it was on fire. I wakened my wife, and I'm not sure she would have wakened me, but that's not important. (laughs) And we got out of the house with only our bathrobe, and the house is on fire. One month before the house caught on fire, we're driving into the neighborhood, and I said to my wife, when you were in East Liverpool, Ohio, did you ever think you'd live in a home this beautiful? And my wife's very, very religious. We've been married 57 years, which tells you I'm an expert at following instructions, but... I, I, I said, do you ever think you live in a home that's beautiful? She said, this home doesn't belong to us, it belongs to God. She said, everything we have belongs to God. So a month later, the house on fire. I said, God, you ought to do something about your house. She doesn't burn that, not mine. <laughs> Here we are, 8 o'clock in the morning, nothing but smoke and ashes. My wife's crying hysterically. I said, you have 24 hours 
to cry, to wallow in self-pity, to feel sorry for yourself. But come 8 o'clock Monday morning, we're never going to look back. We're not going to say why, what if. We're going to move forward. I gave her an unlimited budget to rebuild it, and she exceeded it. <laughs> but the good Lord put eyes in front of her head rather than back so we can see where we're going rather than where we've been. And what I want to share with you in the next 30 minutes is how I try to build a team and how I would build it today with the millennials. And that's not very, very complicated. Understand that. We complicate life. Do you realize there are only seven colors of the rainbow? Look what Michelangelo did with those seven colors. There's only seven musical notes. Look what Beethoven did with seven musical notes. There's only ten numbers. Look what Bernie Madoff did with ten numbers. So, <laughs> I'm not saying it's all good, but it doesn't have to be complicated. I'm going to make four assumptions of the people in this room. Number one, I'm going to assume, and I have great respect for you. I understand the academics that you've gone through, the various colleges, medical school, internship, etc. I understand the sacrifice that you've made to be in the position you are. But I also want you to understand what an important role you play in the hopes and dreams and ambitions of so many families. My wife is in very poor health right now. But I thank good Lord that she is still with me because of the people like you in this room. They care enough about the patient, care enough and made a commitment to this to help people. And they don't always come and say, hey, thank you, you did a great job. But I'm going to assume you want to even be more successful professionally. I'm also going to assume you want to have a good personal life. I don't believe you have to sacrifice your personal life in order to be successful professionally or vice versa. I'm also going to assume you want to feel needed. That if you didn't go home, people would miss you. If you ceased to practice, that your patients would miss you. The last assumption I'm going to make, you want to feel secure about your future. See, I think everything starts with a dream. First of all, let me tell you the dumbest thing I've ever done. Went to the University of Notre Dame, we took a program on the bottom. We took it at the very top. For nine straight years, we went to a January 1 bowl, the sugar, the cut, and the orange, or the fiesta. Nobody's done it before, nobody's done it since. We took it on top and we maintained it. It's the dumbest thing I've ever done. There's a rule of life, you're either growing or you're dying. The tree's growing or it's dying, so is grass, so is a berry, so is a business, so is a person. Doesn't have a thing to do with age. Has everything to do, am I trying to improve, am I trying to get better? I know you're here because you want to get better. You have 70 different educational programs for you. But so many times we get on top, we say, that's pretty good. We finished second in the country. You don't know everybody call me? An idiot. That idiot finished second. Guy finishes last in medical school, they call him doctor. That doesn't seem fair, but that's the way life is. But you get on top, you say, let's not change anything. Let's maintain. Let's not risk anything. And any time you try to maintain anything, you have no excitement. <coughs> you have nothing you're trying to accomplish, nothing you want to get done. And when I left Notre Dame, I never thought I'd coach again. How do you, where do you go from Notre Dame? According to my mother, you go directly to heaven, you sit by the Pope, you, you don't coach anymore. And then I went to live in a town where the average age is deceased. And, and what I found out, I wasn't tired of coaching, I was tired of maintaining. So you don't ever want to maintain your marriage, your personal life, your professional life. It's all, it's, what, how can I get better? How can I improve? How can I make a difference? Now I want to give you three simple rules how we build a team. I've taken over six college situations, never inherited a winner, never failed to go to a bowl game by the second year at the latest. And of course, we had to have good fundamentals, blocking and tackling, Absolutely. But there are three things that I want done to build a team. And I'm not a doctor, but if I was, I would ins insist that these three rules be followed. The same three rules I use in my personal life, the same three rules I use in raising our children. My greatest accomplishment by far is not coaching, not speaking, not TV. My greatest accomplishment by far is my family. The rules aren't very, very complicated, but rule number one, do what's right. Just do what's right. I think it's right beyond, it's right beyond time. I think it's wrong to practice sexism, racism, spousal abuse. 
There's never a right time to do the wrong thing. There's never a wrong time to do the right thing. I don't think it's right to find a teammate's wallet before he lost it. It's called stealing, son. Just, just do the right thing in the bottom of your heart. And I think the most important thing about doing what's right is the attitude we have. Say, ladies and gentlemen, we have, we have all kinds of powers. But the greatest power we have is the power to choose. There are 400,000 words in English vocabulary. The most important word by far is the word choice. You can choose to act or procrastinate, believe or doubt, prayer, curse, help or heal, succeed or fail. But wherever we are because of choices we make. You choose to do drugs, drop out of school, join a gang, get tattoos from head to bottom, get arrested, you're choosing to have difficulty in life, and please stop blaming me. The one thing we have to do is get people to make good choices. And rule number one is just do the right thing. I'm at, I go to the College of William Mary. Now, unfortunately, we had more Marys than we had Williams when I went there. But uh, Davis White Pascoe hired me, wanted to join the ACC. South Carolina left the ACC. They had a vacancy. And he wanted to build our football program, and that was my goal. We built a very good program. Second year, we win the conference championship, go to a bowl, and it looks like we might get into the ACC. But then, Davis White Pascoe gets sick, and he resigns. They hire a president from the Ivy League who wanted to get rid of scholarships. Now, there's nothing wrong with that program, but that isn't what I wanted. I wanted to be able to compete with the Bear Bryants, the Woody Hayes. I wanted to compete against the best, and I wasn't going to do it if we were going to go Division II. And during this summer, the guy resigns as head coach at North Carolina State, Earl Edwards. They sent me a letter and said, we'd be interested in you if you'd be interested in us. But we're looking at a lot of different coaches. We just want to find out who would be interested. I wrote him back and said, I'd be very interested, but I will not talk to you during the season. It would be unfair to our football team. I recruited these players. I have an obligation to give them my undivided attention. They said, okay. We started out in the next year. We won our first four games. We beat Tulane down to Orleans. I came home. North Carolina State calls and said, would like to talk to you about the job. I said, I, I won't do it. It's unfair to our players. I said, if you won't talk to us, we can't consider you for the NC State job. Because signing date's the first Saturday in December. I said, I'm really sorry to hear that. They said, well, thank you and goodbye. My hopes and dreams to get into a major college were going down the tube. But fortunately, near the end of the year, we played North Carolina. They're our tribal. They were 10-1, had a great football team, and our starting quarterback was injured. I had to go with a second-string quarterback, a guy named John Gargano out of New York, 5'8". We had a great receiver, David Knight, played eight years in the NFL. We go down there, we play a fabulous game. Now remember, North Carolina is 10-1, and and the only loss was to Notre Dame. They had the number one defense in the country. We're never behind. We had 35-28 with only three minutes to go in the game. They have third and ten. Paul Miller fades back. Before he gets hit, throws the ball as far as he can. It bounces twice right in front of me. Receiver jumped on top of it. There's one referee who could see it ruled it incomplete from our conference. The ACC ruled it complete. He couldn't see it. it was, the referee came up, overruled it. Said it was complete. I got two 15-yard penalties without using profanity. Now, that's not hard. That's not easy to do. <laughs> he went from there 20 to our 20 on an incomplete pass. They scored with 30 seconds to go. Went for two. Lewis Jolly catches the deflection. We lose 36-35. I'm devastated. I go home, and the phone rings. It's NC State. They said, Coach, we've been listening and following you and saw what you did with North Carolina today. We would like to tell you what the job is, and you don't have to interview. The job's yours if you want it. Well, now I know I'm going to leave. I said, great. Monday of the last game at the quarterback club, they gave me a new car. I said, I can't take it. They, they said, well, well, it's not to keep you here for what you did. I said, I refused to take it. And I went home, never said a word. I come home after our last game. I walked in the house. My wife said, honey, you won't believe what happened today. She said, today they called me on the stands and gave me a new car. I said, we can't keep it. She said, they gave it to me, and I ain't giving it back. <laughs> she said, furthermore, we won't get to Raleigh in the old car anyway. And we drive their new car to NC State. I know everybody will William Mary say, that wasn't the right thing to do. But the point I make, the, re <laughs> the reason I give you that story is if you try to do what you know in your heart is a right and proper thing, it will work out in the long run, and your self-confidence goes up. And... and it's also right to have fun with what you're doing. 
I know you're such a critical job. I know the pressure on you. You go into the operating room and the future of the person's lying on the table. I understand that. But I also think it's so critical to enjoy life. So many people go through life with a frown on their face all the time, worried about it. Enjoy it. People say, do you have fun doing TV? Not really. I'm on there with a guy named Mark May. And Mark May is a wonderful guy, but we had a difference of opinion, and it was authentic. We had no teleprompter, no script, no rehearsal. Mark was a player. As a coach, he made suggestions. I made decisions. He showered me after work. I showered before work. He signed a paycheck on the back. I signed it on the front. You know, just that's it. And I would say to him all the time, I'd love to agree with you, but if I did, we'd both be wrong. And that, that's not real good. But enjoy what you're doing. I didn't want to be up there, but when the TV light came on, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to enjoy whatever I'm doing. Every day I walked out on the football field, first thing I said, boy, what a great day to work, and I meant it. If you have fun, people want to be around you. Doesn't mean you don't do dumb things. I get on TV one time, go to the University of Auburn. Well, then I'd get back on TV and apologize and say, last week I called at the University of Auburn. Many of you people wrote, tell me, it's Auburn University. I'm a quick learner. I won't make the mistake again. You don't have to write me anymore, but thank you. I then turned to Reese Davis while we're still on the air and said, Reese, I had no idea that many people from Auburn could write. <laughs> you want to talk about nasty letters after that. Hey, and don't let anybody else ruin your attitude. We're, we're at Notre Dame, but we're going to play Florida in this Sugar Bowl. Coached by Steve Spurrier, they had a great football team. I thought we'd win, which we eventually did, but nobody else gave us credit. Always wanted our team to be with their family on Christmas Eve. During those two days, I took my wife and my four children. We came to Orlando. We have four children. They're all girls but two, and I'm real proud of that fact. And I'm never happier with them when I'm with my family. And the waiter came up, and he recognized me. He said, you're a little old tech coach at Notre Dame, are you? And I said, yes, sir. And I immediately took out my pen thinking one autograph. He said, let me ask you a question. What's the difference between Notre Dame and Cheerios? I said, I don't have a clue. He said, Cheerios belong in a bowl, Notre Dame doesn't. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I, I, I'm rather competitive. We're in the state of Florida. I get mad. I, it puts me in a bad mood. My wife said, you're going to let somebody you never met before, you're never going to see again, doesn't care a thing about you, and you're going to let him ruin an evening with your family because something stupid he said. She said, you cannot let other people control your attitude. And she's right. And my attitude changed. We had a wonderful evening. I felt so good a little bit later. I called the waiter back over. And I said, son, let me ask you a question. What's the difference between Lou Holtz and a golf pro? He said, I don't have a clue. I said, a golf pro gives tips, which he found out when the meal was over, exactly what I meant. <laughs> I, I could talk forever about the importance of rule. Just do what's right. Rule number two. Do everything to the very best of your ability. Not everybody can be all American. Not everybody can be all conference. Everybody can be the best that they can be. And if we're going to be the best we can be, let's understand what's our mandate. I had two mandates as a coach. Graduate and win. That's all. Graduate and win. You have two mandates. Help the patient make a profit. If I graduated and didn't win, I'd get fired. If I won and didn't graduate, I'd get fired. You are trying to suck, help the patient and make a profit. That's your two mandates. When I went to the University of Notre Dame, an hour before the press conference, Father Hesburgh said to me, Coach, in an hour we're going to go in and I'm going to announce to the world you're the head coach at Notre Dame. He said, I cannot announce to the world you're the leader of the Notre Dame football team. He said, I give you the title. Because titles come from above. He said, the players will determine if you're a leader. I said, what makes a leader, Father? He said, if you're going to be a leader, you have to have a vision where you want to take the organization. You have to have a plan of how you're going to get there. You have to lead by example, hold people accountable. But the most important thing, you have to be willing to change as the situation and environment changes. But don't ever lose sight of your vision. You're trying to satisfy the patient and make a profit. And when we talk about teamwork, about working together, every time I went into a losing situation, one of the first things I did, brought them into the stadium at 10.30 at night. They weren't very happy campers. Then I had a huge rope, and I said, offense on one side, defense the other. We had a tug of war. The offense would usually win. Yeah, 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 we won. 
I said, we can't win when we pull against each other. I would then sit him down and talk to him some things about teamwork that apply to you as well. First point I made, we need each other. We need offense, defense, kicking game. In that surgical room, you need each other. You need the nurses. You need the anesthesiologists. You need the doctor. You need all kind of people. Let's understand. There's all kind of Hall of Fame, but I've never seen a monument built to a team. But a team enables you to accomplish something that no individual can accomplish, regardless how multi-talented he may be. The second point I make, we have a goal, and you have a role. You must do that role the best of your ability so we can accomplish our goal. Perhaps our goal is to save the patient. Whatever role you have, I expect you to be totally prepared, totally focused the entire time. I expect you to be the very best you can be. If you want to fail, you have the right to fail. You do not have the right to cause other people to fail because you don't do everything to the very best of your ability. I'm at the University of Notre Dame, and I was talking to the young man that played at Florida, and I told this story when I talked to the team many years ago. We're headed to Stanford, 16 nothing. Coached by Bill Walsh, we blow the game. And I, I can't stand to lose. See, my personal belief is if you want to accomplish something, you will find a way. If you want to do something bad enough, if you want to get through medical school bad enough, you'll find a way. But if you don't want to do something bad enough, you'll find an excuse. And excuses are a lot easier to find than a solution. And we lost because I let little things slide. We'd had so much success. You take for granted, although do it on Saturday. You do little things. Little things make the difference. And I said to the players, I'm raising the standard. As a leader, your obligation is to make people better and to raise the standard. Too many people in a leadership role that want to lower the standard to keep people happy. As Woody Hayes told me when I coached Ohio State, we won the national championship, you want a friend by a dog. Your job as a leader is to have standards. And most people don't know how good they're capable of achieving. So they try to slide through the minimum. And it's even more abundant today. But whether as coach of a millennial or not, I would demand that we have a goal and you have a role. You must do that best of your ability. So I said to the players, we're going to have a physical practice, which we did. We had an All-American guard, Aaron Taylor, was injured. Didn't take very long into practice to realize the second string left guard was just going through the motions. The other 10 guys are playing their heart out with nothing to show for it because his man made every play. And I stopped practice. I said to the left guard, what gives you the right to cause your teammates to fail? If you want to fail, you, you don't have that right. Explain to them why. He hemmed and hauled. I said, go stand on the sideline and think about it. I'm so mad. Third string left guard jumped at huddle. I said, no, we're going to play without a left guard. I hadn't planned it, but I was mad. We broke the huddle. The defense said, what do we do? I said, act like we have one. Rick Meyer takes the ball, gives the ball to Reggie Brooks, our tailback. Oliver Gibson comes through the vacant left spot. Hits Reggie Brooks as soon as he gets the ball. Tremendous thud, moment of silence. Reggie started to moan he couldn't see. Scares you. Turned his helmet around. He was okay and came back to the huddle. <laughs> After three plays, that opened rebellion. I said, what's wrong? What? We don't have left guard. I said, when did you notice? We haven't had one all day. <laughs> I'm tired of pretenders. I'm tired of imposters. I'm tired of impersonators. We played last Saturday with eight players and three imposters. I'd rather played with eight. Oh, we would have lost, but everybody said, wow, if we had 11 like them, nobody beat us. We never lost again for the next 17 straight games. You have a role, and we have a goal. I expect you to do that role the best of your ability to help us achieve our goal. The third point I try to make is the challenge escalates. The need for teamwork must elevate. You don't need teamwork to go on 11. But if you're going to accomplish anything worthwhile, you've got to work together. And the greater the challenge, the more important it is. In one year at the University of Notre Dame, we played the following teams. Michigan, Penn State, Miami, Florida, Tennessee, Alabama, Texas, Southern Cal, and Stanford. Somebody said, how'd you sleep when you look at that schedule? I said, like a baby. Woke up every two hours and cried. I thought, oh. <laughs> but it's just understanding the challenge. And the fourth point is we have to embrace change. 
Change. Make whatever changes you need to make to satisfy the patient and to make a profit. With all the government regulations, I have no idea what they are, but I know the government gets involved in something. They complicate it. But you have to be able to say, what changes do we have to make? Don't say, well, let's try this. Let's ch Don't change for the sake of change, but make whatever changes. How can we help the patient the best? And how can we make a profit? Those two things. What do we have to do? What changes do we have to make? They tell me in 1878 they invented the typewriter. Problem with the typewriter, if you type too fast, the key's stuck. They said, we'll never sell a typewriter. So they come back and said, we got it solved. He said, how are you going to get it to type faster? He said, we can't. But we're going to hide the letters on the keypad. We'll put A up there. We'll put B down there. We'll put Q there. All right. Didn't you wonder why the letters on the keypad are screwed up? That's so you couldn't type fast. Now today, no matter how fast you type, it won't stay. Well, oh, don't change it, because I'm used to that. People fight change because they're used to something. Be willing to change. I want everybody here to picture a train wreck, a huge train wreck, two trains coming together, collide. Get it in your mind. I guarantee you, everybody in this room, picture that train wreck from a safe distance away. You're going, boy, is that going to be a bad train wreck. Now you're on the train. We're going to have a train wreck. Now you're willing to make whatever changes have to be made. Don't fight change. I could talk for an hour. Usually I do talk for an hour and 15 minutes, but they gave me 30 minutes. But understand, don't everything to the best of your ability, which brings me to the last rule. Show people you care. Ladies and gentlemen, you're never going to meet anybody again. Doesn't need a smile, a kind word, encouragement. My wife's a cancer survivor, stage four, squamous cell carcinoma of the throat. She had 13 hours of surgery, 83 radiation treatments. I don't pray for her anymore. I pray to her. She's a saint. But we're opposites night and day. She said opposite track and then attack. And she doesn't have a sense of humor, but she left me a note several months ago on my desk. It said, Lou, I can't please everybody in the world, so I'm going to stop trying. And I'm going to focus on pleasing one person a day. Today's not your day, and tomorrow doesn't look real promising either. <laughs> She's done one interview in her entire life because that had to do with cancer. And she's on TV, and they said, what did you learn about having cancer, Mrs. Holt? She said, I learned how much my family loved me. We didn't love her anymore. We showed it. Why do we have to wait for somebody to have difficulty in their life before we reach out and let them know we care? Because I promise you, you're never going to meet anybody again that doesn't need encouragement, doesn't need some friendship. And my wife said, how can you talk about caring about people? with a bumper sticker on your car. I have a bumper sticker on my car. We go to church Sunday morning. She makes me park in the back a lot so nobody can see it. The bumper sticker said, Jesus loves you. Everybody else thinks you're an asshole. <laughs> I think it's funny she doesn't like it. I, I could talk forever about caring. And the first thing you try to do, you try to build a love in an organization, a genuine caring for one another. I would not tolerate anybody that can't get along with other people to reach out to them. You build a love in an organization, whether it's your family, whether it's your business, whether it's a team. It, it, it just it permeates success. And those are the only three rules you'll ever need. And I promise you, you can talk about millennials, you can talk about your family, if that, you'll never need a fourth rule. And why are those three rules important? Because everybody you meet asks three questions. Every patient that comes in there asks these three questions. Everybody in the operating room asks these same three questions about you, the same three questions you ask about them. First question everybody asks mentally, can I trust you? Ladies and gentlemen, without trust, there could be no relationship. And trust also is transparency. My wife and I have been married 57 years because I can trust her and she can trust me. My secretary gives her a, my schedule every single week where I'm going to be every minute of the day. I, I, if I lose the trust of my wife, that marriage isn't going to work. Now, if trust is important to have a relationship, there's only one way I know that you build trust. If both sides does the right thing. Remember rule number one? Do what's right. You do what's right because it's the only way you can build a relationship based on trust. 
The second question everybody asks, are you committed to excellence? Do you want to be good? Oh, you can have all the slogans you want. First will be best, then we'll be first. You send a message whether you're committed to excellence by the standard you have, by the preparation you've made, by the neatness and cleanliness. All I ask everybody, I want you to do the very best you can with the time allotted. Not because somebody's going to applaud you or give you an award. It's the way you live. It's the way you breathe. And the only way that you can answer the question, are you committed to excellence? If you do everything to the very best of your ability at all times. Third question everybody asks, do you care about me? Do you care about me because I can run or throw? Or do you genuinely care about me as an individual? Ladies and gentlemen, all I ever tried to do was build trust and build a commitment and build a love. And those three rules enabled me to do it. There's a statue of me at Notre Dame. I guess they need a place for the pigeons to land. I don't know. But if you look at it, don't look at the statue. Look at the pedestal. There's three words on that pedestal. Trust, commitment, and love. I didn't put them there. The players in Notre Dame put them there because those are our core values. Those are things I really and truly believe. I'm at the University of South Carolina. We have the longest losing streak in the country. My first year, we're 0-11. Now, we're old and 11 that year, but records could be deceiving. We really weren't as good as our record would lead you to believe. <laughs> and I find out about June 8th, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, two players were arrested for selling drugs. Had the whole team in summer school. They ate dinner at 6 o'clock. I said I want a team meeting at 7. I went into that team meeting. I was so mad. You know I was mad. I'd been there 18 months. And they still didn't trust me. They didn't trust me to tell me what was going on. I was mad. I want to know why. Nobody said anything. Finally, a sophomore got up, Jonathan Martin. He said, Coach, I trust you. He said, I believe this team trusts you. He said, most of my teammates, I can't trust you. You lie, you cheat, you steal, you do drugs, don't care about anybody but yourself. You cut every damn quarter and went on and on. Then Andre Goodman, a junior defensive back, played 11 years in the NFL, got up, said, I agree with him. I go lock my locker. I go take a shower. I go lock my locker. You'll pill for everything I've got. There was no trust. There was no commitment. There was no love on that team. And I hadn't planned. I said to the manager, give me a sheet of paper. I want you to write down everything you've done to violate the trust, commitment, and love. It'll be confidential. Bring it back tomorrow when summer class is in at 2. They came in. I said, follow me. We went out to the practice field. South Carolina had tradition. Every time they won a big game on the road, they put a little tombstone. Had the date to name the score of the opponent. Wasn't a very big graveyard there, just a couple of them there. I had a tombstone delivered this big blank. Dug a hole, put all the papers in, burned it up, covered up with dirt, and put the tombstone back. But more importantly, we made a commitment. We're all starting out new. But if anybody violated the trust, commitment, or love, the players would no longer tolerate anybody on that team. Six months later, we had the second greatest turnaround in the history of NCAA football. Finished 18th in the country, beat Ohio State on January 1. Following year, finished 11th in the country, beat Ohio State again on January 1. The point I make, that if you can build a trust, commitment, love in the surgical room or in your family, I promise you. Now, there's no such thing as magic. My time's rapidly, rapidly running out. I'd like to do a simple little trick for you, but here's what I need you to do. Just like any other newspaper, you have front page for people who want to read the news. You have the comics for people who can't read. And we always have the editorial page for people who can't think. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to take two people. Take somebody you love, admire, and respect. Take somebody you've got a problem with. Put these three questions on both people. A simple yes or no. Can you trust them, yes or no? Are they committed to excellence, yes or no? Do they care about you and the organization, yes or no? I guarantee the person you admire and respect, you just said yes to all three questions. The person you got a problem with, I used to do this with a phone book when I was younger, but the <laughs> person you got a problem with, you pinpointed the problem. Either you can't trust them, they aren't committed, or they don't care. See, there isn't any such thing as magic and anything else you do. If you find somebody you can trust, somebody's committed, and somebody cares, I promise you, put your arm around them, hug them, never let them go. Now, somebody said, how'd you do that? Perfectly, I thought. But in any event, that's not important. But the point I make.
And, and as, as King Henry VII said to his third wife, I'm not going to keep you much longer, but for the next two minutes, the person you might respect, you said yes to all three questions. The person you got a problem with, you pinpoint the problem. You can't trust them, they aren't committed, they don't care. You sit down with them. Remember, when people need love and understanding the most, is usually when they deserve it the least. If I went back into coaching, I'd be a better coach than I've ever been before. Now, don't, don't tell me about the millennials, because what you say to them is important. But what you say is not near as important as your tone of voice. Your tone of voice is not near as important as your facial expressions. Now, I use three words of profanity, hell, ass, and damn, and they're all in the Bible. But when a guy fouled up, and well, I put my arm around him and say, Jim, that was a dumbass thing to do, and you have no idea how mad I am. You're going to find out come Monday. <laughs> the madder you get, the more you smile, the softer you speak. But whatever you do, do not lower the standard. You're doing them a disservice. Don't tell me about your wants and dislikes. I have those three rules, and that's all I want. I've never needed a fourth rule. When I stood up here, I knew 10% of you wouldn't remember 10% of what I said 10 minutes after I said it. But I appreciate your kindness. I shouldn't have talked that long, but it's your fault. Had you gotten up and left, I'd have stopped a long time ago, but it's your fault, not mine. But I congratulate you on what you've done, the difference you make in people's lives, and how great you must feel to know the difference you make in people's lives. I leave you this very last thought. Want to be happy for an hour? Eat a steak. Want to be happy for a day? Play golf. Want to be happy for a week? Go on a cruise. Now, me going on a cruise like being in jail, except you have a chance to drown, but if that's what you want to do, so be it. Want to be happy for a month? Buy a new car. Want to be happy for a year? Win the lottery. You want to be happy for a lifetime? Make sure people would miss you if you didn't show up. As Mark Twain said, the two most important days in your life, one's the day you're born, the other's the day you discover why you're born. And we're discovered, we would discover we were born to help other people. And in your leadership role, you were born to lead, but also to make sure people maintain a high standard. I look forward to listening to Kevin's uh, speech this morning, and then I'm going to uh, have lunch with you. But congratulations again. Thank you for having me.